Well, I'm here again, and I'm right now I'm mounting the scope on my uh, 22250, and uh, getting the epoxy stuck in my hand. You like that? That's why we wear junk shorts. Anyway, this is going to be another video on church security. Let me get rid of this dip. All right. You're going to find in most churches, they have, especially considering uh, what's been going on in the world lately, as far as these active shooters, which are, you know, a direct direct result of the degradation of, of morality in the United States, and, and the type of uh, upbringing children have been having these last generation or so. The self-entitled bit. But anyway, your church, unless it's completely irresponsible, has a security plan. What is it? Well, they're not going to tell you what it is. That would be irresponsible. Okay? But if you sit back and you watch, you can see what it is. For somebody like me who who has a, quite a bit of experience in this kind of thing and, and observing people can uh, pretty much see what it is. So what you see in some cases is that they are securing a particular individual, usually the pastor or a couple of individuals that might include the pastor and his wife or, or the first family, as you might call it, in a church which I, I am reluctant to call the shepherd the first family when biblically he's supposed to be the last. Anyway, so I make these videos and I know they, they have got some responses. They do, they do anger some people. I don't care. Remember, remember the story in the Bible of the woman that pestered the, the, the uh, king for so long until the king lamented? Well, that's kind of what I do. So, the question is, is in, your, in your church security plan, if you sit back and watch and you see a certain number of individuals always hanging around a certain person or persons, who are they actually securing? Are they securing them? Are they securing you, your children that are in another part of the building? What? Well, the children in the other part of the building, you're going to say there's an adult with them. Yeah, but that adult is unarmed and can do absolutely nothing in the face of an active shooter. And we're talking about level two active shooter where there is pre-planning, where he's come in and he's seen who is who, okay? And maybe he's even a regular member of your church, okay? And that's why when uh, when a member of your church is, is exhibiting signs of mental illness, you need to, you know, address it. You need to focus it on, give it, give your concerns to somebody else, okay? Now, it's not saying that he, that he was exhibiting signs of mental illness, that he is a threat. In fact, the odds of him actually being a threat are very small, but it is something to pay attention to on two different levels. One, you are obligated as a Christian to care for your brothers and sisters. And that just doesn't mean care for them if they are, if they are, have cancer or some physical disease or anything like that. It means care for them. And that includes caring for them if they are mentally ill, either whether they're briefly going through a mental crisis or whether they're long-term mentally ill. That being said, look at the where the security concerns seem to be by the people who seem to be hanging with the same people all the time. Okay, and if that's not on you, that's irresponsible for the church. Now, Everybody knows that I'm a, I'm a proponent of concealed carry. And I'm a proponent of concealed carry just about everywhere. And the, the, the real problem is, is our legislature, in its infinite wisdom, has made it a felony to carry a concealed firearm in a church without that church's permission. That being said, that means that the church does not have to follow the same protocol that a private business would in imposing the sign. 
Now, if I walk into private business who was posted to sign and I have a concealed weapon on me and they discover it, that is a misdemeanor. Okay. Yet, if I have that same weapon in a church, in a place of worship, worship, that is a felony. Recently, a bill was passed that expanded the areas where I can carry my concealed firearm, uh, which included into certain situations in daycare centers, on school grounds, things like that. Okay. The original bill slated to say that to take churches off the list of where it would be a felony. So if a church didn't want you to carry, then they would have to post a sign like any other entity, which is exactly how it should be. So the church now, the church now, would if they allow people to carry, would assume a certain level of liability. That's why they would have to be extremely selective on who they allow to carry. Um, now, they sometimes think if they allow a police officer to carry that they would be covered because he is a police officer. That is not the case. If he is working for you, if you say you can carry, you just made him a security agent under Ohio law, and you made yourself liable. Now, they turn around and say that, well, they don't want people popping up and shooting and returning fire and maybe hitting somebody else. I got a guy that's actively killing people. I ain't worried about straight bullets. This guy's actively doing it. Anyway, so the problem with this is, is not in the church who has, has a split interest in covering, covering the security of its people, but also in avoiding civil liability. Um, the answer is to change the law. That's the answer. And every time we turn around, they come up with a new law, they exclude churches because churches want it that way. Churches don't want to have to say, you can't carry here. Because they know they're going to make their parishioners mad. Okay, a lot of them. Okay, churches want to, want to push that off on the state. Look, well, here's the thing. If you want the state to make a law regulating anything in your church, including the, 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 the carrying of concealed weapons, then you have to accept the, the state mandating that you do anything that it says. You know, it's, it's a two-sided coin. So when that state turns around and says you have to perform homosexual marriages, you have to do it. You just, you already opened the door and let the state make influence in your church. So when they state tell you something to do something in, in, in violation of your beliefs, you got to do it because you gave them authority. Pretty harsh, isn't it? But that is reality. You want to stay in your church or you don't. You stuck just well when I want them to be, and then when I don't want them to be, we're good. Okay, well, they got to stay out. But if they're doing what I want, then then that's good. That that's a that's a that's a bad way to look at things. Okay. So when you're at church, look at the people who are obviously security people, and you'll see them they're hanging close to certain other people. If you see one or two people hanging close to your pastor, hanging close to your pastor's wife, and your pastor's family, guess who the focus of the security is on? Not on you, not on your children, on the shepherd who was supposed to lay down his life for the sheep. I, I take that literally. It's not just figuratively. But, you know, is the pastor a bigger target? A little bigger target. Because one of these people, that one of these nut jobs that's going to come in and do this is not looking particularly to kill, to kill the pastor. He may shoot the pastor because the pastor happens to be the one in a prominent position, isolated. Um, he's looking to cause as much death and mayhem as he can. And if he really wants to hurt people in church, he goes after the kids. That's right. He comes in and he knows beforehand that the kid ministry is here. Okay, the nursery is here. If I really want to hurt you, if I want to really cause terror and make my name well known in a nefarious manner, I kill the kids. Okay? It's horrible. I get that. Anybody who wants to do that is going to go, what is going to create the greatest horror? It's a sick mind. You're going to remember that. So... The answer is, the final answer in the end, is to change the law in the state of Ohio 
to remove the felony level restriction of carrying a concealed firearm in a place of worship. That's the answer. Okay? And your legislatures are kowtowing to the, to the, uh, religious people who are asking them, remember, they didn't take that section out of that last bill, you know, because they thought, because the legislature thought it was a good idea. You can bet some church councils came to them and said, this is, we don't like this. We, you really need to take this out of this proposed law. All right. Uh, tomorrow you're going to start doing homosexual marriages. Sorry. Oh, and stop preaching an anti-homosexual, anti-abortion messages in your churches because guess what? These are legal. And political correctness says they're good things. There it is. And am I going to keep on counting this? Oh, yeah. Am I going to blame the churches for, for not allowing concealed carry? I can't. I can't blame the churches for not wanting to risk. They're in a position, okay? They, they're, they're in a damned if you do, damned if you don't position, okay? They're damned if they do. If something happens and a bullet hits an innocent person, which is going to happen in that situation, I don't care if it's a private individual shooting. I don't care if it's a police officer shooting. Police officers miss six times out of ten. And that bullet lands somewhere. Logic has it that there would be a certain number of people in the crowd who would be carrying a concealed weapon. They're mixed into the tapestry of the crowd. They're not able to be singled out, unlike the people that you have assigned to security that are standing on doors or standing next to the, next to the altar or whatever. Okay. Ideally. But your legislature needs to change that. And you need to call your legislature, your legal representative and say, this needs to change. I need to be safe in my place of worship. All right. That's all I got to say. Uh, people thinking I was blaming the churches themselves. No, I understand the church's liabilities. I get that. But, you know, we need to change this program. And nobody should be able to walk freely walk into a church, a place of worship, and kill a bunch of people, especially when Christ himself told us to carry a sword for our own self-defense. And I don't care if you Christians, my Christian brothers and sisters, want to try to spiritualize that and say, well, they were talking about the sword of the Spirit. You're full of crap. They were not. There is nothing in that passage, nothing in that passage, that, that indicates that Jesus was making an analogy. Unlike his use of the word sword, where he's talking about, I come not to bring peace, but a sword, where I sever. You understand, he explains what the analogy means. And that whole, and that whole uh, part there, um, before he goes to the Gethsemane, okay, he is not making analogies on anything. He is talking directly. It's not, you know, anything else but direct talk. The things he said was directly said. No analogies, no figurative statements of any kind. It was direct. And if you really, if you read that scripture with, with uh, literary integrity, and you go to the beginning of the section, and you go to go to the end of the section which we don't tend to do as Christians because we like to look at single verses. If you do that, then you'll find out that Jesus was talking literally all the way through. And somebody tells you he wasn't, they're lying to you, or they're misconceiving what was said. All right, bye. Let me just kind of squeeze over here and give a face, give a poke on that. Okay. Whew, bye.